Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, we're fortunate today to hear from one of our own, Andy Lux. Um, just give you a little, I know many of us are very familiar with him, but to give you a bit of background, um, Dr. Lux went to undergrad at Duke University where he graduated summa cum laude. Um, went into, uh, got an MA in poli science at Stanford before, under, before going on and deciding to do medicine, where he went and did his medical school at UC San Diego and ultimately found the University of Washington for his internship, residency, chief residency, home fellowship, and we've been very fortunate to keep him on as faculty. At this point, he's an associate professor of medicine, um, and we've been, and many of us have enjoyed and got, been able to be lucky enough to work with him. He's a renowned teacher for many levels in our system. Most residents and med students are very familiar with the, for the med students, the many courses he teaches throughout their medical school, um, as well as working actively with the uh, medical and paramedics program and doing many national um, seminars at the American Thoracic Society and Inter um, International Conference. He has many um, awards and honors in the teaching, specifically Distinguished Clinician Clinical Teacher Award. He has received the Beeson Award uh, for Outstanding Clinical Teacher. He's also received the UW Student uh, School of Medicine Distinguished Teaching Award um, and multiple Professor of the Year Awards. I think one of the most the more interesting named awards he's received is the Wilderness Medical Society ISAC Award, which I'm curious if that comes with an ISAC. Um, it actually does. <laughs> oh, <nice. laughs> um, obviously well published and many um, over 50 peer reviewed journals multiple and met numerous about high altitude pathologies, which is a great passion of Dr. Lux's, and he's here today to speak to us on advising the high altitude traveler. Thanks. Well, uh, thanks very much, Lindsay, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak here at Grand Rounds about a topic that I really love thinking and talking about as well. And as I was putting this together, I realized it's probably one of the few topics in medicine that I actually know more than Marvin Turk about. <laughs> so I'm gonna start off by saying that I don't have any disclosures to report regarding any of the things I'm gonna talk about in the next 45 to 50 minutes. And having done that, I wanna start with a question for all of you, and that question is pretty straightforward. And that is, what is it do you think your patients are doing when they're not seeing you in clinic talking about their medical problems? Now, we live in here in the Pacific Northwest where we have a lot of very active people, and I'd be willing to bet that a good number of your patients are doing things like heading off to try to climb Mount Rainier. Some of them want to trek and eventually make it to Everest Base Camp in Nepal. There's a good number of them who probably have it on their bucket list that they want to get up to the top of Kilimanjaro, the tallest peak in Africa. And then finally, if you deal with any climbers, a lot of them probably have it on their radar that they want to get up to the top of the tallest peak in North America, and that is Denali. Now, accomplishing these things is huge for a lot of these people. But it also poses risk to them because, as you notice, these places are all located at very high elevations, and that puts people at risk for getting sick. Now, some of you are probably sitting here in the room saying, look, you know, my patients have severe disabilities. They are not going off and doing these types of things. And you'd be wrong because people with disabilities do get out there into the mountains, such as this gentleman bilateral amputee who was trying to climb Denali as part of the Warfighter Sports Expedition in 2012. He's already come up 7,000 feet on the mountain at the time that this photo was taken. Now, I know Stuart Shanklin over here, and Stuart's saying, look, my patients that I see in nephrology just do not have the physical wherewithal to do anything like this at all. But your patients do things like get in their cars and get in their recreational vehicles and go to places like this, Independence Pass, at over 12,000 feet in Colorado. Why do they go? Well, the guidebook said it was a really interesting thing to do, and who wouldn't want to go up to the Continental Divide? It sounds really cool. So in the end, your patients, whether you realize it or not, are heading off to high altitude to do a variety of different things, whether they're active or sedentary. And this has the potential to create several different situations that you might have to deal with in clinic at some point with these individuals. The first situation is what I refer to as the altitude naive traveler. They decided to book a trip to Kilimanjaro. They've never been there in the past, but they've heard that the altitude can cause some problems. So they're coming into your clinic wondering, how do I prevent these problems from occurring on my trip? You might also deal with the returning traveler. This is the person who never saw you before they took some trip off to high altitude, but they had a problem on their trip. And now they're coming to see you in clinic to find out what happened, 
And is this going to happen again? Because I want to go back and do this. I had a lot of fun otherwise on my trip. And then finally, the most concerning situation of all is the potentially risky traveler. This is the individual who's got some underlying medical problem. But they've decided, for whatever reason, they want to go to high altitude, and they want to know whether it's safe, and they're going to be asking you that question. And the goal of my talk today is to provide you with a practical approach for dealing with each of these three potential situations that you might encounter in clinic. The altitude naive traveler, the returning traveler, and the potentially risky traveler. So let's start by talking about the altitude naive traveler. And we can begin that discussion by, by considering where they may be going that are actually going to put them at risk for problems from the altitude. In general, the main physiologic responses to hypoxia start when people get above, or really kick into gear when people get above about 6,000 feet in elevation. And the risk for altitude illness starts when people get above about 8,000 feet in elevation. So anywhere that you see marked on this crude map of the globe in black or listed in that table on the right are regions where they can get up and stay above that elevation and are at risk for difficulties related to the altitude. Now, when they get up into these areas, the main environmental problem that they have to deal with is just pretty straightforward, and that is with ascent and elevation, the barometric pressure decreases in a nonlinear manner. And as a result of that decrease in barometric pressure, the partial pressure of oxygen is lower at every step of the oxygen transport cascade, from ambient air to inspired air to the alveolar space, arterial blood, tissues, and even venous blood. And those decrease in oxygen tensions in the blood and in the tissues is going to kick into motion a whole range of physiologic responses designed to help the individual adapt to and perform OK at high altitude, but occasionally leads to maladaptive responses. And in those situations, the person becomes sick. So one of your main roles when you're seeing the altitude naive travel in clinic is to counsel them about the potential problems that they may experience on their trip. And the three main things that they're going to be at risk for developing within the first couple of the days to, of ascent to high altitude are going to be acute mountain sickness, or AMS for short, high altitude cerebral edema, or HACE, and high altitude pulmonary edema, referred to as HATE. Now, of these three problems, acute mountain sickness is by far the most common and the thing they're most likely to encounter on their trip. But the other two problems are potentially very, very severe and even fatal in some situations. So any altitude traveler needs to be able to recognize these problems if they're developing either themselves or someone else on their trip. And your big role is to counsel them about how to recognize these problems. So we can step through how you're going to recognize each of these three entities. And we can start with acute mountain sickness. This generally comes on anywhere from about four to eight, six to 10 hours after people have gotten up to elevations of about 8,000 feet or higher. And in order to say that someone has acute mountain sickness, what you're looking for is that they develop a headache plus one or two other symptoms. And those other symptoms can be the fact that they're nauseous or sick to their stomach, severe lack of energy, persistently lightheaded or dizzy when they're standing up. The current definitions also refer to poor sleep as one of the criteria for diagnosing this, but that's currently being reevaluated because it's become increasingly recognized that even individuals who are doing fine at the altitude have a terrible time sleeping. Now, importantly, to label someone as having acute mountain sickness, they have to have a normal neurologic status and a normal mental status. Okay? If they don't, they may have something much more severe going on, and that is high altitude cerebral edema. The underlying pathophysiology for this is still not clear, but it might, in all likelihood, is the same disease as acute mountain sickness, just sits at the opposite end of the spectrum of severity. And as the disease accelerates, these people manifest evidence of a global encephalopathy. So they have ataxia. Their mental status is off. And in the severe cases, they become somnolent, and they can even lapse into a coma. Now, importantly, this is global encephalopathy. So if someone has the acute onset of a focal neurologic deficit or symptoms come on after more than five days at altitude, you've got to be thinking about other entities. But if you see this picture in someone who's just come up, you got to be concerned that they've got the case. And then the final acute altitude illness they need to be able to recognize is high altitude pulmonary edema, or HAPE. This can actually be seen at fairly moderate elevations, such as 8,000 feet, and is seen quite commonly in Colorado, for example. This is a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, meaning left ventricular function is normal. 
And this is totally driven by an excessive rise in the pulmonary artery pressures in these individuals that causes fluid to leak out of the vascular space into the lung tissue. And early on in hate, people become very dismal with exertion, way out of proportion to what the normal person is experiencing at altitude. And they're having trouble keeping up, falling behind everyone else, leaning a lot of rest breaks. And as things get worse, they become out of breath with very simple activities and even at rest. And they can become profoundly cyanotic and also cough up pink, frothy, and even blood-tinged sputum at points. So your patients need to be able to recognize these three entities if they're going to be traveling to high altitude. But it's also important to counsel them that even if they're feeling fine, they're not developing those problems, they are going to feel different at altitude than they do at sea level because of all the normal physiologic responses to acute hypoxemia. So for example, their heart rate is going to be higher at rest and with any level of physical exertion than it would be at sea level. Sleep is going to be terrible for most people. They can't fall asleep. They can't stay asleep. There's a very high incidence of central sleep apnea. And exertion is way harder at high altitude than it is at lower elevation. People are far more out of breath with any exertion at altitude than they would be lower down, even if they're in very good physical condition. And it's important to counsel people about these normal changes that can occur at high altitude because if they don't understand that these things are all normal, then they're going to start to overreact and think that they're getting sick when, in fact, they're doing just fine, exactly as you would expect them to do. And then there are three final things that you want to be counseling these individuals about. And the first one is probably the most important thing they need to understand about altitude illness besides how to recognize the problems, and that is why people get sick. And people, in general, get sick because they go too high too fast. And it doesn't mean they run too quickly up the trail. What it... The best way to explain it is this, is that you take an individual who's going to go from sea level to 15,000 feet in elevation, and they want to sleep there for a couple of nights. Well, if they do that ascent up to 15,000 feet in only two days before sleeping there, they are way more likely to get sick than if they spread out that same ascent over a five or six day period. They also need to understand that the response to high altitude varies dramatically between individuals. So just because their neighbor went and did an ascent of Kilimanjaro in only five days a couple of years earlier does not mean that they can get away with the same ascent profile when they do it. They may very well get sick themselves. And then finally, being in good physical condition, although it's great for helping you tolerate the difficult physical work at high altitude, does not protect you against acute altitude illnesses. The great athlete is just as susceptible as the average couch potato, which makes the couch potatoes of the world extremely happy when they see this person doubled over with a rip-roaring headache or bad nausea and vomiting. Now, you might be wondering, well, is there any way that I can help my patient identify ahead of time whether or not they're at risk for developing one of these problems when they get up to high altitude? And unfortunately, there are really no good prediction tools out there that you can easily use in clinic. There was a nice study that was done recently by a group in Paris, France, where they looked at a series of clinical factors as well as performance on an exercise test to try to predict someone's risk for severe altitude-related disease. And what they did is they measured a variety of parameters, including their minute ventilation and their oxygen saturation, when they were at rest in normoxia, at rest in hypoxia, during exercise in hypoxia, and exercise in normoxia. And what they actually found is that those people who had the smallest changes in their minute ventilation when exposed to hypoxia or the largest decreases in their oxygen saturation when exercising in hypoxia, they were at high risk for developing severe altitude-related disease. This is actually a very nice study. They had a huge derivation cohort for their model, and they had an equally large validation cohort. But this isn't really that easy for most people to implement on a regular basis in clinic because most of us can't easily do cardiopulmonary exercise tests in clinic, let alone add on the hypoxic exposure. So at this point in time, you still are left without a good way of identifying whether someone's at risk for these problems before they go on their trip. So what can you do instead to decide how much they're at risk for these problems and whether or not to put them on pharmacologic prophylaxis against altitude illness when they're traveling? The Wilderness Medical Society put out some guidelines in 2010, and they were updated in 2014, which help in this regard. And what they recommend is that what you do is look at the patient's intended ascent profile when they're going to high altitude, 
And using a variety of factors such as how high they're going, how fast they're getting there, how high they're sleeping, whether they've been ill in the past, try to rate their ascent profile as low, medium, or high risk. And then use that to decide who gets pharmacologic prophylaxis. If someone has what you think is a low risk ascent profile, they probably don't need pharmacologic prophylaxis at all. It's adequately slow, they're gonna do just fine without it. But if they have a moderate or high risk ascent profile, you should strongly be urging them to consider uh, prophylaxis with various medications in order to decrease the risk of these problems. It's not necessary, but something they should strongly consider. What are those prophylaxis options? Well, the main thing you're trying to prevent is acute mountain sickness, because this is by far the most common problem. And the standard for doing this remains the same thing that it was when Eric Swenson last spoke about at Grand Round several years ago about high-altitude medicine, and that is acetazolamide and dexamethasone. There's been some recent interest in ibuprofen because there was a nice randomized controlled trial done down in California a couple of years ago where they compared the use of ibuprofen to placebo in individuals ascending from low elevation acutely to about 12,000 some odd feet and showed that ibuprofen decreased the incidence of acute mountain sickness. But this hasn't taken over in place of acetazolamide for AMS prophylaxis at this point for a couple of reasons. One, no one's ever shown that it's actually more effective or as effective as acetazolamide at decreasing the risk of altitude illness. And the exposure in that study was actually short, just a couple of days. And I think if someone was doing a longer trip, such as a two-week trek to Everest Base Camp, the safety of using ibuprofen at a reasonable dose for that duration of time at altitude is not clear. There are some prophylactic options available for high-altitude pulmonary edema, but you don't put anyone on these medications if they've never had hate in the past. So we'll actually talk about those a little bit more in just a bit. Now, there has also been some interest in some other strategies for preventing altitude illness beyond medications, and these things are referred to as pre-acclimatization and <coughs> stage descent. What pre-acclimatization refers to is you have an individual who wants to eventually climb to a high elevation, and in the days to weeks before they go up there, they make repeated ascents to more moderate elevations. And then in stage ascent, you've got the goal that you plan to achieve, and then what you do in the days leading up to it, you go up to a moderate elevation and you stay there for a period of time before working your way higher to your eventual goal. And the idea is that these exposures to the lower elevations kick into motion a lot of the physiologic responses that are helping your body adapt to the altitude. And studies have shown that these, can, these approaches can blunt some of the adverse physiologic responses, such as the increase in pulmonary artery pressure, and decrease the incidence of acute mountain sickness. But the problem is that no one at this point knows what the best recipe is for implementing either of these strategies. No one knows how high you need to go, how often you need to go there. So it's hard for you to recommend any specific approach to your patient. But in general, if they can get up high on a frequent basis beforehand, that will probably provide some benefit. And then the final thing the altitude naive traveler needs to know is how do you deal with these problems if they actually develop during the course of their trip? The general principle is simple. You got sick because you went up in elevation, so the easiest way to make things go away is go down. But fortunately, not everyone needs to go down. The people who develop acute mountain sickness, a low severity form of altitude illness, they simply need to stop ascending Use some symptomatic treatment like acetaminophen or ibuprofen for their headache. Maybe add on some acetazolamide or dexamethasone. And if they get better, they're good to continue their trip and go on to wherever they wanted to go. But in severe disease, if someone's got cerebral edema or high-altitude pulmonary edema or they're just not getting better from their AMS, those people need to go down. Or if the sense not feasible, you've got to be thinking about, can we get this person supplemental oxygen or access some health facility somewhere? And in the HACE patients, they're going to need to be treated with dexamethasone, and the hate patients are going to require nifedipine until you can get them to access some care and either descent or uh, supplemental oxygen. Okay. So to summarize the general approach to the altitude-naive traveler that you may see in clinic, your big role with these people is to counsel them. Counsel them about how to recognize the main forms of altitude illness, and importantly, how to recognize when they're actually doing fine and just experiencing the normal physiologic responses. And then you're going to want to take time to evaluate the risk of their planned descent profile and help them make a decision about whether or not they need to add on pharmacologic prophylaxis or whether the slow ascent itself is just fine. So having looked at the altitude uh, 
naive traveler, we can now switch gears and talk about the person who's coming back from high altitude. They went off to do some trip. They never saw you beforehand because they thought they'd be fine, but they had a problem. And now they're back in your clinic because they want to figure out what went wrong and how can I prevent this problem in the future if I want to go back. What can they come in telling you happened on the trip? A lot of different things. They might have, give you a good story for having had one of the three forms of acute altitude illness, but there's actually a whole host of other things that can happen to them in the course of their trip. They might have had a really bad viral upper respiratory tract infection that just didn't go away. Very common problem when people trek in Nepal. They might have unmasked some unrecognized coronary artery disease exerting themselves in a hypoxic environment. They had vision problems, and then there's been a whole host of other things that have been documented in the literature, such as transient global amnesia or transient cortical blindness. So they can come in telling you a lot of different stories. The challenge is trying to figure out what went on. If your patient accessed the healthcare system during the course of their trip, in particular when they were sick, you might have some additional information that you can use to sort through what happened. You might have a chest radiograph, a blood gas, pulse oximetry data, maybe even echocardiography data. But the problem with a lot of people who get sick at high altitude is that some problem happens, they realize this isn't right, and they just descend to lower elevation, they get better, and they return home and they never contact the healthcare system in any way until they're sitting in your clinic. And in those situations, you'll be lucky if you have as much as some pulse oximetry data to tell you what their oxygen saturation was when they got sick. And the implications of this is trying to figure out what went on in their trip more often than not just simply comes down to taking a very good history from them about what they were experiencing, how fast they were ascending, and a whole variety of other factors. You will not have a ton of other data that you can rely on. If you do have pulse oximetry data, it is very helpful, however, in evaluating the person who had some type of respiratory issue at high altitude. Lots of studies over the years have established that when people develop high altitude pulmonary edema, they are markedly hypoxemic compared to normal individuals at the same elevation. So if you have someone coming back with some type of respiratory issue that occurred on their trip and they have pulse oximetry data, and you can tell that their oxygen saturation was about what you would expect someone to have if they were doing okay at that given elevation, it's pretty hard to label them as having hate. But if they were way more hypoxemic than you would expect at a given elevation, then HAPE is definitely high on the list of possibilities, though they might have had something like pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, or other things that can cause gas exchange problems as well. You might wonder, how do I figure out what the normal oxygen saturation is at a particular elevation? It's not easy, but there are studies in the literature that help you uh, do this if you're able to look a little bit for that data. Now, the question that's going to come up once you once you tried or gotten a bead on what you think is going on with these individuals is, do I need to do any further evaluation on these people before they go back on another uh, trip? And if someone gives you a good story for acute mountain sickness or high altitude cerebral edema, there's no further evaluation that you need to do because there's no tests that you can do to predict their risk. There's no characteristic physical things that predispose to this problem. For HAPE, however, I think you need to do a little bit more thinking in the back of your mind and occasionally consider some further evaluation because there are a lot of cases, and I'll mention some a little bit later, where people had some unrecognized cardiopulmonary abnormality, such as an absent pulmonary artery, that predisposed to the development of this problem. And then certainly if someone has recurrent high altitude pulmonary edema over multiple trips, I think they may warrant some further evaluation as well. And then for the other problems that come up, it really just depends on what you tease out as to whether or not they need further evaluation. If someone's giving you a good story for chest pain with exertion at altitude, they may need some further cardiac evaluation here, for example. Now I'll give you a little sense of why I think sometimes the HAPE susceptible individuals or someone who had HAPE warrant some further uh, assessment. So there's been some nice studies done by the research group in Heidelberg that Eric Swenson has worked closely together with, where they've shown, looked at people who are truly hape susceptible, and they've shown that the hape susceptible individuals have a very characteristic phenotype marked by exaggerated pulmonary vascular responses to <coughs> acute hypoxia. What they did in this particular study is they used echocardiography to estimate pulmonary artery pressure in normoxia, at rest in hypoxia, and then with exercise in normoxia and hypoxia. And what they demonstrated is that these hape susceptible individuals had markedly exaggerated pulmonary artery pressure responses compared to normal individuals who are not susceptible to this problem. 
So if you have someone who's given you a good story for this, if you wanted to get a sense of whether or not they're truly a susceptible individual, you could consider having them do a hypoxia altitude simulation test and using echocardiography to estimate their PA pressures and see if they meet this characteristic pattern. Not required, but something you can consider. Another question that always comes up with these patients is, well, they had some problem at altitude, in particular acute altitude illness. What's the likelihood that this is actually going to occur again with an ascent to the same elevation at roughly the same rate? And the same group from Heidelberg, as well as a group that does a lot of work together with them in Zurich, have shown through repeated studies of hape susceptible individuals in the Alps that about 60% of these people will have a recurrence of their hape with a subsequent ascent back up to the same elevation at roughly the same rate. And in general, your past performance at altitude, at least with regard to acute altitude illness, your past performance is a pretty good but not perfect predictor about how you're going to do in the future. If you went to 10,000 feet in a single day in the past and you got sick, there's a pretty good chance, but not a 100% guarantee, that you're going to get sick going to 10,000 feet in a single day in the future. But if you slow down the rate of ascent, you probably can avoid some problems in that situation. Now, people who have been sick at altitude in the past with acute altitude illness, I think, should strongly consider going on pharmacologic prophylaxis against these problems. For AMS and HACE, it's the same medicines we talked about before, cetazolamide and dexamethasone. But if someone's got a good story for high-altitude pulmonary edema, you want to be using some sort of pulmonary vasodilator to blunt the pulmonary artery pressure responses that occur following ascent. And the standard is nifedipine. You could also consider using a phosphodiesterase inhibitor like tadalafil. And there was one study done about six, seven years ago where they showed that dexamethasone was actually beneficial in preventing HAPE in known susceptibles. But it hasn't supplanted nifedipine at this point, largely because no one quite understands the mechanism by which it worked. And that study hasn't actually been repeated uh, to this point. I think there are some other things that I would definitely consider in someone who had problems at altitude in the past and they want to go back there in the future. The first is try to get them to go more slowly in terms of their ascent rate than they used in the past. Slow things down, give their body more time to acclimatize, and hopefully decrease the risk of altitude illness. And I think it's also important that they think about some sort of exit plan. Because no matter what you do in terms of pharmacologic prophylaxis and counseling, you can't guarantee that they're not going to have a problem again in the future. So get them to think about, how am I going to descend or access care if I get into problems? And recommending traveler's insurance, particularly for travel abroad, is not a bad idea. So for the returning traveler, the key things in evaluating these people, it's good history. Do not expect you're going to have a ton of other data at your disposal to help you sort out what went on. Some of these patients will require some further evaluation to think about their risk in the future for these problems or sort out some other medical problem that cropped up. And I think with these people, particularly if they had altitude illness, you should strongly be considering pharmacologic prophylaxis against this if they want to go back up in the future. All right, so we've looked at the altitude-naive traveler. We've looked at the returning traveler. Now let's think about probably the most concerning situation for most of us, that is the potentially risky traveler. This is someone who's got some sort of underlying medical problem, mild or severe, and they want to go up to high altitude, and they're in asking you, hey, do you think this is a safe thing for me to do? And to get into this discussion, I want to pose a question to the audience here. Here's an individual with idiopathic giant bullous emphysema, and you see a slice in this individual's CT scan. And this person had a forced expiratory volume that was only 56% predicted. So it would be rated as moderate severity obstructive lung disease with that anatomic abnormality. This person shows up in your clinic and says, hey, I'd like to go skiing in Montana. And the resort that we're going to go to, the runs are anywhere between about 9 and 11,000 feet in elevation. So show of hands, how many people in this room would tell this individual, yeah, Sounds good. Have fun. I think it's a reasonable thing to do. Dr. Huff, going for it. How many people think, eh, can you maybe think of another idea about what you can do on your vacation? OK, way more hands are going up in favor of the, I'm not quite comfortable with this issue. 
So let's think about how you would approach someone with severe underlying medical problems who wants to go to high altitude. And it turns out that evaluating these people is challenging. Because on the one hand, there is an increasing number of studies that are finally appearing in the literature looking at how some diseases are affected by hypobaric hypoxia. I don't have the time to go into all the data that's out there about all the common diseases that we see, but let me give you some examples of what's in the literature about two very common problems. Asthma. This is a problem that a lot of young, active people may be dealing with when they want to head off to the mountains or engage in other activities. There have actually been a relatively good number of studies looking at both physiologic responses as well as clinical responses, showing that if you have an individual with mild, persistent asthma that's under good control at the time that they're leaving for their trip, those people do fine with a sense to some pretty high elevations. So one study, for example, showed that if you did methacholine challenges on these individuals, they did not have an increase in that bronchoprovocatory response. And other studies have shown that they don't have an increase in their symptoms or need for rescue inhalers. So the mild, well-controlled asthmatic is probably going to do just fine at altitude and should obviously remain on their standard medications, carry rescue inhalers and steroids with them. If someone has moderate or severe persistent disease or their disease is under worsening control when their trip is slated to go off, no evidence in the literature about these people. I'd probably be much more wary about them traveling to high altitude, particularly into remote areas. How about obstructive sleep apnea? Extremely common problem in our population. Now, you might think, well, they have obstructive sleep apnea. It's due to a physical obstruction in the upper airway. So when they go up in altitude and the air density decreases, they might actually have less upper airway obstruction, which would make their obstructive sleep apnea better. Well, a group in Switzerland did some very nice studies on people with moderate severity obstructive sleep apnea. And they showed that with ascent to about 8,500 feet in elevation, there was no significant change in the number of obstructive events during the night. But importantly, these individuals had a marked increase in the number of central sleep apneas during the course of sleep, such that the overall apnea hypopnea index was increased in these individuals with all of its associated problems in terms of poor sleep, et cetera. So there are some diseases, asthma and COPD being two good examples, where we're starting to get some more information about how certain disease processes respond at high altitude. But the problem is, though, that despite there's an, in fact there's an increasing number of studies, some of the studies are not very good quality. And so it's hard to really tee off that and figure out what to do with your patient. And then we still lack information on a large number of diseases that people might be wanting to travel up to high altitude with. And so you need some of an approach to deal with these particular situations where either the d data is are poor or they're missing altogether. And what I think is useful in those situations is to step back and look at your patient and use a structured approach that's focused on three questions that will help you assess their risk for problems. And those questions are first, is my patient at risk for severe hypoxemia when they get up to high altitude out of proportion to what the normal individual is going to experience with the scent? Second, you're going to ask, is my patient at risk for impaired ventilatory responses? In other words, are they going to be able to raise their minute ventilation as much as I would like following ascent? And then finally, is my patient potentially going to get, it, uh, get into trouble as a result of impaired, va uh, uh, impaired pulmonary vascular responses that can happen following ascent to high elevation? And I'll take you through each of these three different questions. So the first question is, is my patient going to be at risk for hypoxemia far out of proportion to what people normally experience with ascent? And there's definitely some patient groups, and you might imagine, yeah, they definitely are at risk for severe hypoxemia. If you look at the literature on flying on commercial aircraft with various forms of lung diseases, a whole variety of studies have established that if you take people with moderate to severe COPD, FEV1s in the 1 to 1.5 liter range, or various forms of interstitial disease and even cystic fibrosis, and expose them to hypoxic conditions equivalent to anywhere between 8 to 10,000 feet in elevation, these people become pretty hypoxemic. And then if you have them do a mild degree of exertion, like walking on flat ground for 50 meters, pedaling on an exercise bike at a very low rate of resistance, they become even more hypoxemic. Now, if we saw these PO2s in our patients here in the hospital, we'd be quite alarmed. And we'd be calling people like myself and Trish Critic and Rob Blaney to say, hey, this patient needs to be in the ICU. 
This may be happening to these people when they're up there at altitude. And you might say, well, what's the risk of that? Well, interestingly, it's not really clear that the hypoxemia that they experience is a, gonna be a big problem for them. If you look in these studies that were done about commercial flight in patients with lung disease, despite the fact that the people were very hypoxemic, there weren't really a lot of big side effects or major complications being reported. These patients were not keeling over as a result of the hypoxemia. And interestingly, the symptoms that they did have didn't bear much correspondence to how hypoxemic they were. But I think the problem is when you think about these studies that are out there in the literature to give you a sense of how hypoxemic they are is that they all involve very short exposures to altitude conditions, just a couple of hours at a time. But your patient who's going to a ski resort in Colorado is going to be spending days there. And at this point, we really don't know how hypoxemic they're going to be over that longer time period and what effect that is going to have on them while they're there. There's some concern that people who are more hypoxemic might be at greater risk for the acute altitude illnesses, but I don't think the studies that have pointed towards this are actually high enough quality to be able to say definitively that that's the case. The next question that you need to ask is, can my patient raise their minute ventilation as much as I would like them to do at altitude in order to help with their gas exchange? All of us have our physiologic response wired into us known as the hypoxic ventilatory response. And when your arterial PO2 decreases, that stimulates the peripheral chemoreceptors in your carotid bodies, which send out signals for you to increase your ventilation. And the idea is that helps you raise your alveolar PO2 and defend your arterial PO2 at a higher level than it would be in the absence of that increase in your ventilation. This response varies in magnitude between individuals, but in general, it's present in just about everyone. And it's a very important response when we get up to high altitude. But I think there are probably two patient groups that you have to worry that they may not be able to increase their minute ventilation as much as you would expect. So there might be a group of patients that have very severe respiratory mechanical problems. So for example, someone with rip-roaring COPD or bad obesity hypoventilation syndrome, or patients that Josh Bendit might deal with in his neuromuscular diseases clinic, but like ALS or muscular dystrophy, who may have difficulty raising their mechanical ventilation. I don't know if there are any football fans in here, but Steve Gleason, who used to play for the New Orleans Saints and developed amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, he went off a couple of years ago to Machu Picchu in Peru, which involves going to high altitude, and this was an issue that they had to wrestle with beforehand. Now, even if people have intact mechanics, their hypoxic drives to breathe may be impaired. So, for example, there's some evidence in the literature that following single-sided carotid artery surgery, people do not mount the same ventilatory responses to hypoxia that they did before their surgical procedure. So I think the concern with either of these groups is that they may not be able to raise their minute ventilation enough, and as a result, they may be at risk for increased hypoxemia following ascent. The third question I think you need to ask is, is my patient gonna get into trouble because of the expected pulmonary vascular responses that occur with ascent to high altitude? Another response that we all have wired into us is what's referred to as hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, or HPV. If there is a decrease in your alveolar PO2. You get localized vasoconstriction to decrease blood flow to that area. This is really designed for someone who has pneumonia, because if you have an area that's socked in with pus and has low alveolar PO2s, you don't want to send a lot of blood flow to that area. And it helps maintain ventilation perfusion matching. At altitude, however, you're gonna have low alveolar PO2s throughout the lungs. HPV occurs on a global basis, and as a result, there's an increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary artery pressure. Most people tolerate that increase in their pulmonary vascular resistance and PA pressure just fine. But I think there are some patients that you need to be a little bit concerned about how they're going to do in that situation. As there's a series of case reports and case series in the literature documenting patients with pulmonary hypertension due to either anatomic causes, such as an absent pulmonary artery, or non-anatomic problems, such as the fact that they used anorexogens in the past, that these individuals following ascent to high altitude develop HAPE. Now, how high your PA pressure has to be in order to predispose to this risk is not clear. And no one has done, people haven't done prospective studies in this regard, but this is a patient population I would definitely be concerned about going to altitude. Another group of patients that I have some concern about, though there's not a ton of literature about this, are the morbidly obese. Because we know that a lot of these people, and it's not always recognized, have obesity hypoventilation syndrome, and as a result, have chronic alveolar hypoxia 
and pulmonary artery hypertension as a result of that. And the risk is they go to altitude. They're exposed to a further degree of alveolar hypoxia, which leads to more hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, a rise in their pulmonary artery pressures that may put them at risk for HAPE or potentially increase the risk of right ventricular dysfunction. And there is actually a case report in the literature of someone going into RV failure during commercial flight. And this was a morbidly obese individual in whom this occurred. So I think you can use these three questions to try to gauge the risk in your patient who's got an underlying medical problem. And when you step back and you look at the data that's in the literature and your answers to those three questions, if you get reassuring data or reassuring answers to those questions, your patient's good to go on their trip and probably needs nothing else in terms of counseling beyond what the standard person needs traveling to high altitude. But there's no data or you're getting concerning responses to those questions, you may need to think about some further evaluation or some sort of risk reduction strategy for these individuals. What are those risk reduction strategies going to be? Well, if your patient's at risk for severe hypoxemia and you think that they're going to get into trouble because of that, you might want to consider supplemental oxygen. If you're concerned about their ability to raise their minute ventilation adequately, you can certainly counteract that problem with supplemental oxygen. You might even consider non-invasive positive pressure ventilation at night if they can travel with a small unit. People that you're concerned about how they're going to deal with the pulmonary vascular responses, if they're not on a pulmonary vasodilator like nifedipine or tadalafil already, I might add that for the purposes of their trip. But if they're already on medications, might have them travel with supplemental oxygen in order to blunt the pulmonary vascular responses to altitude. And then finally, if they're at risk for their underlying disease getting worse in some respects, that's a person that you may need to do some very disease-specific planning for that person. And to give you an example of some disease-specific risk reduction strategies that are out there, the group in Switzerland that did that nice study about the patients with obstructive sleep apnea showed in a randomized study that if you add acetazolamide to auto-titrating CPAP following ascent, and acetazolamide is something known to decrease the incidence of central sleep apnea, when you add acetazolamide, these people have better oxygenation during the night and a lower apnea hypopnea index. So a very nice example of a very disease-specific risk reduction strategy that you can use for your patients. In other cases, like someone who has diabetes, it may just be a question of, hey, you need to check your sugars more frequently, and we need to have a plan for altering your insulin uh, accordingly. But you do need to be aware that in some situations, you just may not be able to mitigate the risk appropriately, or you just simply can't guarantee the person that they are going to be okay on their trip. And in the end, some trips are going to need to be canceled. Your patients are going to have to deal with that fact in certain circumstances. Now, you saw that I mentioned supplemental oxygen as a tool that you can use to re reduce the risk in a lot of these different situations. But many of you may already know from your experience in practice that arranging supplemental oxygen for travel is a huge hassle. It's costly, flying on planes with oxygen tanks is a disaster, right? But I think there are some other things that you can consider for these patients. You might, for example, rather than having travel with oxygen tanks or trying to arrange oxygen tanks wherever they're going, have them rent, maybe even purchase, depending on their financial resources, a small portable oxygen concentrator. You can actually take oxygen concentrators on the majority of commercial airliners in the U.S. and internationally as well. And if they have good access to power and recharging their batteries on their trip, they'll be fine. Rather than having them travel with oxygen, the other thing you can consider is have them get a pulse oximeter. Travel with the pulse oximeter and see how their saturation's doing following arrival wherever they're going to be. See how their symptoms are doing. And then also have them travel with a prescription for supplemental oxygen and if they, that they can fill if they're running into problems. That's hard to do if you're trekking in Nepal, but if you're traveling to a ski resort in Colorado, home care companies are going to be available that could make something like this feasible. And then just with the returning travel, I think there's some other important strategies you should consider as well. The first is a lot of these people want to get up to high altitude and get going, right? Get up to the top of the gondola chair and bail and start skiing. But I think when they've got a severe underlying medical problem, get them to slow down for the first couple of days. Let their body adapt to the environment. And these patients definitely need to plan ahead of time about how they're going to monitor their disease and how they're going to evacuate themselves to either a healthcare facility or a lower elevation in the event that they develop problems that they can't get under control when they're up there. And this is a group that definitely needs traveler's insurance. 
So to wrap up the discussion of the potentially risky traveler, let's go back to the question I posed earlier to you about this individual with idiopathic giant bullous emphysema who wanted to go skiing in uh, Montana. Well, this individual actually did this on a regular basis. He lived in Montana. And he would go to the ski areas and would go up to runs anywhere from 10 to 11,000 feet in elevation and ski down. And at the, at the bottom of the runs, I'll tell you, he was blue. <laughs> and he was very hypoxemic, but he just rested for a little bit and was able to get back on the ski lift chair and continue on through the rest of the day. Okay? Now, not everyone can do this. And the fact that he was a mountaineer in the past and had lived at moderate elevations probably allowed him to tolerate this better than the sea level travel going up for the first time. But I think it demonstrates that a lot of people that on the surface you might look at and be like, oh, no, no, this is not a good idea, may actually do better than you think, particularly if you can think well enough about the problem ahead of time and devise some appropriate risk reduction strategies uh, for them. Okay. So with that in mind, I'm going to conclude uh, this morning's lecture with a couple of key points. Interest in adventure travel is increasing, and the ease of getting to various places around the world is increasing as well. So people are getting off to high altitude, whether you know it or not. And that's going to create a bunch of different situations that you may have to deal with in clinic. For that altitude-naive traveler, they need really good counseling about how they might get sick, how to recognize when they're actually doing just fine, and then thinking through whether or not they need pharmacologic prophylaxis. The returning traveler, they need a good history to sort out what's going on, may require some further evaluation, and it probably should be strongly considering pharmacologic prophylaxis for these people if they had altitude illness in the past and want to go back. And as we just saw, there are certain classes of patients that definitely warrant some further evaluation and thought beforehand. And I think with a good review of the data in the literature, as well as thinking through those structured questions, you can come up with a pretty good assessment of whether or not it's safe for them to go and in more cases than you might expect, it would be a reasonable option for them to head off on their trip. So with that, I'm all done, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Andy? Yeah. Hey, Thank you. That was terrific. Uh, how do you counsel about specific classes of medications? And I'm thinking about things that people might take to aid them with sleep at high altitude or medications that people might take for pain or particular classes of antihypertensives or other cardiovascular meds. So Paul's question relates to what do you, how do you counsel patients about various medications that they want to use at altitude? And I think it really depends, Paul, on the class that you're talking about. For pain medications, this is a challenging issue. I think opiates are a bad option at altitude, particularly before sleep, because they're going to depress someone's ventilation, which is the opposite of what you want to be doing. So I'm very wary about someone going to altitude. Um, if they've been on them for a long period of time, maybe OK. But certainly de novo prescriptions uh, would not be a good idea at altitude. We generally stay away from it. Sleep medications, people have actually done some studies. What you're looking for is something that improves sleep but doesn't improve subsequent daytime performance in these people. And the studies have shown that acetazolamide is effective for improving sleep. And other studies showing that temazepam and zolpidem are also effective and safe and don't seem to impair daytime uh, performance afterwards. For the chronic medications that people are on, there's really not a lot of good evidence out there about what to do. I've always had some concern in the back of my mind about beta blockers, for example, because your heart rate is supposed to increase when you're exposed to uh, acute hypoxemia in order to help maintain oxygen delivery, and the beta blockers may blunt that. But that's never really been systematically studied. And some of the studies that have been, the one or two studies that have been done in heart failure patients exercising in simulated high altitude have actually shown that the beta blockers are fine. Uh, for these uh, people. So it's not clear how to deal with that in some situations. That's why I think you have to just think about a plan for how are you going to adjust your blood pressure medicines, uh, for example, if you get up there and you're, you're either feeling dizzy or lightheaded, for example. Oh. Andy, enjoyed the talk. Uh, could you uh, go forward a little bit more on people with appropriately treated heart failure or coronary artery disease? Uh, what, what do you tell them? Because that, to me, that's a much commoner question I get. Tom Robertson's question is, what do you, how do you counsel the person with heart failure or coronary artery disease? 
So amongst that growing body of literature on underlying diseases, there has been some work done on the coronary artery disease patients. And the, the gist of that is that if someone had a myocardial infarction or had coronary artery disease and not an MI and then was revascularized in some way, that after waiting about three to six months, they're probably okay with ascent to high elevation. I think there's far less data out there in the literature regarding the heart failure patients. The one published study that I'm aware of was involved exercise studies with a very short duration of uh, hypoxia. There's another study that's in abstract form. I don't think that's, that's made it out yet. And they showed they may actually tolerate it okay, but I think that, data, that body of literature is um, limited. We know that in every one of those at the altitude, your maximum exercise capacity goes down. And what is known is that the more severe your heart failure, the greater the decline in your maximum exercise capacity you're going to have uh, following ascent. Scott. Yeah, Andy, I'm having a little trouble understanding the pathophysiology by which excessive hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction leads to hate. Because I would assume, like in other capillary beds, the site of vasoconstriction is the pre-alveolar uh, arterial or sphincter which, if anything, should reduce the distal pressure. So why are you getting more exudation of fluid from the capillaries if you've constricted them before the alveoli? Okay. So Scott's question relates to how people who have excessive pulmonary vasoconstriction end up getting high-altitude pulmonary edema when the site of the vasoconstriction is upstream of where the leakage of the fluid actually occurs. And Scott, the general thinking is that the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction that occurs in these people is very uneven. So you have areas where it's active, other areas where it doesn't occur. But overall, pressure rises, and with the higher driving pressure now, there's more flow, and that greater flow through these unprotected areas where the vasoconstriction hasn't happened overloads those capillaries that then leak fluid out into the interstitium and the alveolar space. Andrew? Uh, that was very interesting, as, as always. Um, I have an anecdote to share, and my specific question is about acetazolamide. The anecdote is I promised my wife I would ask you this question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is a lady in pretty good physical condition, but at age three had uh, respiratory failure after getting intravenous penicillin and uh, required an emergency tracheostomy. Uh, ever since then, uh, despite visits to three separate uh, travel medicine clinics, they have told her absolutely no way, don't even go near acetazolamide as an option for some high altitude exposures above 14,000 feet. And uh, having looked into it, I think the science is pretty soft about acetazolamide, penicillin allergy, but this question comes up more than you might imagine when you start talking to other people who have done travel. Yeah. So I was wondering what's your take on that issue? So the, the question really is, what do you do about acetazolamide and medication allergies? And I think the bigger concern with acetazolamide is less the penicillin allergy than the sulfa allergy, because the medication does have uh, sulfa moiety. Although I think we know that people who are allergic to one class also tend to be allergic to other classes uh, as well. So this issue has not been well studied at altitude. There's definitely case reports in the literature of people having very severe anaphylactic reactions to acetazolamide when they had a documented sulfa allergy in the past. But that risk of cross-reactivity is actually on the low side. So I think there are two ways to approach this situation. One, just have the person do a supervised trial of acetazolamide here at sea level before they head off to their trip. Because if you are one of those rare people who does cross-react, some remote valley of Nepal is not the place to discover that for the first time. But the other thing is, I think it's a perfectly valid alternative. Just use dexamethasone, which shouldn't be associated with that problem. And there's reasonable literature, uh, data in the literature showing that it's, it's effective for preventing acute uh, mountain sickness. And so I think that takes the drug allergy thing right off the uh, table in that situation. Yes? Uh, two questions. Uh, does the age of the traveler affect the risk of uh, altitude problems? And the second one, do coca leaves work? <laughs> Okay. So the first question, does the age of the traveler affect the risk of altitude illness? And people have tried to look at this It's in various studies in the literature. I don't think they're high-quality studies. And some studies say that there's a signal that older individuals are protected, and other studies have not shown much of a difference. My gut sense is 
what accounts for the difference between an older individual and a younger individual is that the younger individual tends to do this on the trail and likes to kind of blitz up and go as high and fast as they go to show that they're strong, whereas the older individual, with the benefit of perspective and a lot of time behind them, is like, <laughs> this is pretty good. I'm going to just mosey along. And as a result, they're just moving slower up to high elevation. Um, and then in terms of coca leaves, if anyone has traveled to South America, you cannot get off the plane there without someone offering you coca tea, coca leaves, saying, hey, this stuff works. And despite its widespread use in South America, no one has ever done a study to demonstrate whether or not it is beneficial for preventing altitude illness. Fortunately, I think the downsides of using it are low. Uh, I don't think the tea tastes very good. Uh, it's kind of bland. But I don't think there's much downside to doing it. So I certainly wouldn't offend people if they're pushing it on me. But if I really wanted to prevent altitude illness, I would be using acetazolamide or dexamethasone instead. Yes, does the history or presence of high alt sickness alter recommendations for hydration, given that some of the drugs are likely to cause hypotension potentially? So the question is, does having had a history of altitude illness and wanting to go on prophylaxis, does it affect your recommendations regarding hydration? This has been kind of a confusing thing over time because there's this sort of long-standing dogma out there that dehydration predisposes to acute altitude illness, and that is actually wrong. Dehydration causes symptoms that are very similar to the nonspecific symptoms that are associated with uh, acute mountain sickness. And when you travel at altitude, it's really easy to become dehydrated because the, um, not only is the barometric pressure is lower, but the ambient humidity is lower, you're hyperventilating, you're using, losing tons of fluids, you urinate more. So it's very easy to become dehydrated and develop very similar uh, symptoms. So you have to really keep up with your fluid intake when you're traveling up there to keep your performance up and then prevent yourself from getting fooled into thinking you have AMS. And then the other thing I would say is if you are drinking more to prevent dehydration, you're not going to overcome what acetazolamide is trying to do for the purposes of preventing altitude illness. Acetazolamide is working by altering ventilatory control, altering the acid-base balance in your body. It's not working by virtue of the fact that it's causing diuresis itself and volume loss. So you can drink as much as you need to to stay hydrated on that medication, and you won't counteract what it's trying to do for acclimatization. Yes? Is there a role for dexamethasone IM as treatment, not just prophylaxis? And would you prescribe that to somebody who's an experienced mountaineer going on like an Everest trek or something else like that? And so the question is, is there a role for intravenous or intramuscular dexamethasone in, uh, in the treatment of uh, high-altitude cerebral edema? And all the published recommendations and major reviews will tell you that when you're treating HACE, it's an initial dose of 8 milligrams followed by four milligrams every six hours, and that initial dose is either IM, IV, or PO, whichever you, way you can get it in, because if someone's got very severe haste, they're not going to be able to swallow a pill uh, very easily. So I think depending on the circumstances, it's not an unreasonable thing to put something like that in someone's hands for the purpose of their trip. I think when people are traveling at altitude, particularly if they're going on private trips, they should be carrying acetazolamide, dexamethasone, and nifedipine in the event that something severe happens. On guided trips, the guides usually have them, although the medical knowledge of guides in various areas around the world is not always that great. So I think it's reasonable stuff to have that stuff along. 